The concept of miniature versions of classic consoles preloaded with a whole library of games is a fantastic one. Done right, it's an affordable way to slip back into previous generations and relive our childhoods. Done wrong, it's the PlayStation Classic. <coughs> Sega is the latest company to throw its hat into that particular ring, and because the selection of games is one of the most important factors in determining whether or not these consoles are worth purchasing, we're ranking every game on the Mega Drive Mini from worst to best. That's the Genesis if you're from North America, but we called it the Mega Drive in the UK and we're doing that for this whole 64 point list, yeah. But Triple Jump, I hear you cry. There are 42 games on the Mega Drive Mini and the number of entries on this list is greater than 42. Who are you trying to fool? The answer is nobody. We're honest and we love you. But the Mega Drive Mini is actually being released in three distinct iterations. There's a Western version, a Japanese version, and an Asian version. Pretty good idea, actually. They each include different games and we'll be ranking all of them. Before we get to the rankings though and you start typing comments about how easy it is to build a Raspberry Pi, a few ground rules. For starters, we aren't just considering each game's quality. Mini consoles such as this one serve as samplers of bygone eras of gaming. So yes, while it's important that a game, you know, isn't terrible, we're also considering its historical value. In addition, we'll be considering how readily available the games are already. It's a small consideration, but if a game has not been included in the many collections Sega has already released, its value on the Mega Drive certainly increases, we think. Yes? No? Well, it makes sense to us, you can like it or lump it. I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and this is every game on the Mega Drive Mini ranked from worst to best. Number 64, Party Quiz Mega Q, Japan. When you think of all the fun you might have with your Mega Drive Mini, you probably aren't thinking about playing a Japanese quiz game full of questions that are almost 30 years out of date. But if you are, Party Quiz Mega Q will be right up your alley. Obviously, this was not a game designed with a Western audience in mind to begin with, so the fact that we won't be getting it should come as no surprise. And just as obviously, it should come as no disappointment. There are far better things to include on a retro throwback console than what is essentially a fancy multiple choice exam. Party Quiz Mega Q did some pretty interesting things for its time, such as supporting five players and including fake commercials to make it seem more like you're participating in a genuine quiz show, but we definitely wouldn't want to sacrifice any other games to play it today. Number 63, Sonic the Hedgehog Spinball Western. We aren't saying that Sonic the Hedgehog Spinball is a bad game, it's just definitely not, in any sense whatsoever, a good game. It is, at the very least, an interesting novelty. Sonic taking the place of an actual pinball is a serviceable concept for a spin-off, and Sega got there with its mascot a full 11 years before Nintendo did with theirs in Mario Pinball Land. Sonic fans were used to seeing the blue blur curled up into a ball, and they'd already bounced and flipped him around pinball-inspired levels, so Sonic Spinball could have worked. Unfortunately, this game was not a product of a development team creative spark, but of Sega insisting on a quick product to plug a release gap. Sonic Spinball came together in only around two months, and its inconsistent physics, irritating design, and distinct lack of fun all make that very apparent. Number 62, Sword of Vermilion, Asia. Fans of RPGs will certainly be saddened to learn that Sword of Vermilion isn't coming westward. Fans of good RPGs, however, will be far less sad. The graphics look okay, but it must be said that they weren't even impressive at the time of the game's original release, and the objectives are so unclear that Sword of Vermilion came packaged with a 100 plus page hint book telling you what to do. The game fares no better in combat than it does in any other area. The range on your attacks is laughably short, so that you're almost guaranteed to take as much damage as you inflict. Your character can level up, and you can buy a very small number of weapons and armors, but while your hero does get stronger, he never seems to get any more competent. 
Number 61, Altered Beast, Western. At this point, we think even Altered Beast would prefer if we all forgot about Altered Beast. While the arcade original has its small, easily ignored place in gaming history, the Mega Drive version likely only sold as well as it did because it was one of the earliest games on the system. The basic concept of Altered Beast is that you're a, a dead guy in Greece, we guess, turning into a a, a wolf? We, honestly, we have no idea. Fans of Tedium will certainly be well served by this game's inclusion, but that's about it. The sad fact that it did sell well is likely why it keeps being told to rise from its grave. Rise from your grave being featured in far more collections than good sense should ever allow. For a game that nobody should want to play, there are already plenty of other ways to play it, and it does not need to be included in the Mega Drive Mini. Number 60, Vector Man Western. From a technological standpoint, Vector Man was an important game. From any other standpoint, uh, it, it was fine, I guess? Question mark? In the more primitive video game generations, developers tried their best to make things look more advanced than they really were. See the wireframes of Battlezone, or the simple polygons of Star Fox, or the balls of balls with a, with a Z. Vectorman did its best to produce smooth animations and gameplay beyond that normally seen on the Mega Drive, by building a character out of 23 simple spherical sprites. The result was indeed impressive by Mega Drive standards, but it's certainly not an approach that has aged well visually, ironically looking more primitive today than many of the contemporary platformers it attempted to outdo. It's worth giving Vectorman a spin just to appreciate the effort, but overall, there's nothing to see sphere uh, here. Number 59, Assault Suit Lanos, Japan and Asia. Some games qualify as punishing, and others qualify as punishment. In the latter category, the lattergree, we have Assault Suit Lanos, which was released in North America as Target Earth. Many games at the time leaned on brutal difficulty as a way of extending playtime, and Assault Suit Lanos is one of those games that leaned on it much too heavily. This is disappointing, because there's actually an innovative game here. Your performance in one stage determines the bonus items you're given for the next. It has more than a dozen different weapons, which is a huge amount for the genre, especially in 1990, and if you thought Halo introduced regenerating health to the video game landscape, you'd be very wrong. Why does everyone think that? For one thing, the health doesn't regenerate, your shield regenerates, and even if it was health, it, it wasn't the first. Assault Suit Lanos may not have introduced it either, we have no idea who, who the first one was, but it's certainly in this game from 1990, so shut up, Halo. A fairer level of difficulty would almost certainly have earned this game a larger audience, as there's so much it does right, but as it stands, it's a frustrating relic that sadly failed to live up to its own potential. Number 58, Eternal Champions, Western. Eternal Champions is one of roughly 40,000 fighting games developed to coast on the success of hits like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter 2. It's also not an especially inventive one. It works, don't get us wrong, and the game's take on Mortal Kombat's fatalities are fun in their own right, but beyond that, the only things Eternal Champions has got going for it are its characters and settings, which are drawn from real and fictional history. Quite interesting. It's worth playing then for its novelty, but not much else. One hot and fresh science fact though, be whip, is that the game was compatible with the Sega Activator, a very early attempt at motion control that, well, didn't work. Thankfully, the game takes pity on anyone who attempted to use the activator, automatically granting them increased attack power and defense, almost like they knew it didn't work. It was the least they could do for the one unfortunate child who actually owned the thing. Number 57, Slap Fight MD, Japan and Asia. Neither a fighting game nor the medical doctor nobody recommends, Slap Fight MD is a hilariously named Xevious clone. But what's the difference between the two games? Well, the name. 
basically. And now that you've experienced that, you can go and play Xevious instead. Okay, that's not entirely fair. Slapfy MD does have a power-up system that owes more to Gradius, and for a clone, it's an admittedly competent one. It may not add much, or anything, to the scrolling shooter genre, but it plays well enough to warrant a few minutes of your time. We're not too fussed about missing out on this one. After all, we're getting plenty of forgettable Mega Drive games of our own. Number 56, Light Crusader, Western. Though it received positive reviews at time of release, Light Crusader's reputation has gone down a bit in recent years, as its flaws have become more apparent, and what little novelty it had, and it was indeed little, has worn off. You are David, a guy with a sword who's asked to fight things in a dungeon. David, being a video game character, agrees to do so. There isn't much to do in Light Crusader, but what there is to do is made tedious and confusing by the isometric perspective. It certainly doesn't look or sound bad, but it doesn't stand out in either of those areas either. It's a mediocre experience at best, and it isn't even an important part of the console's history, as nobody in their right mind cares about it. Why, why is it here? Any, anyone know why this is here? No? Okay. Number 55, Toe Jam and Earl, Western. Your personal level of tolerance for the sustained absurd idiocy of Toe Jam and Earl is something we can't speak for, but for us, it's fairly low. To be clear, the game's bright colours and incredible soundtrack are definite selling points. <laughs> But its limited gameplay and aimless silliness get tiresome far too quickly. The game tasks you with walking around a floating island to see if one of your lost spaceship parts is there. Then you take an elevator to another floating island to see if one of your lost spaceship parts is there. Instead, riveting stuff. The map layouts and locations of the spaceship parts are randomised, which you'd think would lead to increased replay value, but it really just means you can't familiarise yourself with the game enough to strip away the tedium. In the parlance of Toe Jam and Earl's time, it's totally gnarly, dude. And please note that gnarly is actually a bad thing, and you've been using the word incorrectly for decades. Number 54, The Super Shinobi, Japan and Asia. Eastern gamers are getting a shinobi game that we aren't, but we think we'll recover because it's really not that good. Known as the Revenge of Shinobi to us Westerners, this was the first game in the shinobi series to be developed with a console audience in mind. As such, there are still a few kinks to be ironed out of the formula. The character movement is stiff as though you're wearing a load of old towels discarded by a massage parlour, and the level and enemy designs feel more frustrating than fair. What's more more, it's unlikely that this will even represent the original version of the game, which contained unlicensed cameos by Batman and Spider-Man, among other famous faces that Sega legally had absolutely no right to use. Of course, it's important to remember that this isn't the worst Shinobi game, it's just worse than most Shinobi games. Number 53, Columns, Japan, Asia and Western. Columns was Sega's answer to Tetris, and it wasn't a bad one. It was different enough that it didn't feel entirely derivative, yet offered a similarly compelling experience. However, it was far from the best falling block puzzler out there. Heck, it's far from the best falling block puzzler on this list. As a filler title, the Mega Drive Mini could do far worse. Columns has a nice soundtrack, is perfect for pick up and play time killing, and is a genuine part of Sega's legacy, as a version of Columns was the pack in title for Sega's Game Gear, but it's unlikely to be the first, second, third, or even thirteenth game people navigate to when booting up their adorable little mini. It exists, and it's a welcome inclusion, but we doubt it will get much more attention from you than it will from us. Number 52, Phantasy Star 4, The End of the Millennium, Japan, Asia, and Western. The Phantasy Star series was the defining JRPG franchise on the Mega Drive, and Phantasy Star 4 was overall the best received instalment. For that reason alone, it's nice to have it in this collection, but it absolutely does show its age. While it still looks and sounds nice, there isn't much to the story, and the story itself is subject to some extremely poor English translations. It's also rather short, with a full playthrough clocking in at around 20 hours. Now that's not 
not inherently a bad thing, of course, but if you're the kind of RPG fan who enjoys finding and completing side quests, this is not the game for you, as there's exactly one side quest. Your mileage with Fantasy Star 4, then, is almost entirely down to how much patience you have for early RPG design that has long been left behind. If you have no such patience, Fantasy Star 4 certainly won't help you to develop any. Number 51, Wrestle Ball, Japan and Asia. Are you familiar with Wrestle Ball? Probably not, because it was released as Powerball in the West. Are you familiar with Powerball? Probably not, because it wasn't very good. Wrestle Ball, which is what we'll continue to call it because that name is hilarious, is one of many futuristic sports games inspired by the 1975 dystopian film Rollerball. It seems that video game developers took one look at that hyper-violent world and thought, huh, that does look like fun. Sadly, Wrestle Ball lacks the inventiveness to do anything interesting with its own concept, and the experience we're left with amounts to nothing more than shuttling a ball back and forth across a small pitch. There's some fun to be had in the two-player mode, but much more fun to be had in, well, the other 50 games in this list, to be honest. Number 50, Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle, Western. In some alternate timeline, Alex Kidd remained Sega's mascot, never to be replaced by Sonic, and thank Christ, we don't live there. Alex Kidd was Sega's original answer to Mario in the same way that, well, a, a nappy full of old needles could theoretically be someone's answer to a stuffed animal. Though he hung around for six games, he never received much love from players or critics, which is good because he deserved neither. Enchanted Castle isn't the best Alex Kidd game, but for the sake of historical documentation, it might put forth the best argument for why the series never caught on. The controls are loose, the level design thoroughly uninspired, and boss fights are literally just games of rock, paper, scissors. Ah, oh, if only the storage space on the Mega Drive Mini set aside for Alex Kidd in the Enchanted Castle could have been used in a better way, such as you know, just be, being left empty, for example. Ugh. Number 49, Shining Force, Japan, Asia, and Western. Shining Force is part of a long-running series that's still receiving games today. That's good news for fans who want a regular Shining Force fix, because they don't have to rely on playing this old thing when it comes out. Shining Force is a tactical RPG that seems to draw a lot of inspiration from Nintendo's Fire Emblem, but it has very little of that game's quality. It does attempt to mimic Fire Emblem's named recognisable units as opposed to generic ones, but it forgot to give most of them personalities, rendering the effort moot. It's not a bad game, but it doesn't do anything to stand apart from any other tactical RPG. What's more, its English translation is legendarily bad, with characters being misnamed and entire plot points being left out. In 2004, the game got a much better Western release on the Game Boy Advance, and as long as that version exists, there will be no need to go back to this one. Number 48, Virtua Fighter 2, Western. You might hear the name Virtua Fighter 2 and think, oh, that's an important part of gaming history, and you would be correct, but you probably wouldn't be thinking of the Mega Drive port of Virtua Fighter 2, which has never been and will never be important to anyone. Remember, the big selling point, and by far the most impressive feature of the Virtua Fighter series, was that it was three-dimensional. The Mega Drive port wasn't. It was two-dimensional. What? Now, it works, and it's fine, but it just isn't Virtua Fighter 2. Had this exact version of the game been released under the name Feel My Knuckles, colon, yet another Street Fighter clone, nobody would have been able to guess it began life as a Virtua Fighter 2 port. In fact, you might say, it's virtually not worth your time. Yeah. Number 47, Wonder Boy in Monster World, Asia and Western. Known in its native Japan as Wonder Boy 5 Monster World 3, what? We have to admit we prefer the game's Western title, which is less easily confused with a football score. It's not, however, the best representation of either the Wonder Boy or Monster World series. That honour would almost certainly go to Wonder Boy 3, The Dragon's Trap, which recently got a very impressive hand-drawn remake. 
Still, Wonder Boy in Monster World is a fun game, if also an unremarkable one. The visuals are appealingly colourful and cartoony, and the soundtrack does its job well enough. But the game has very little character, and the regular drip feed of items and upgrades never really shaves away the repetition of batting simple enemies with your sword over and over again. In fact, for a short game, it does a pretty good job of wearing out its welcome. Number 46, Kid Chameleon, Western. If you disregard the existence of most platformers ever made, Kid Chameleon is one of the best platformers ever made. In this reality though, it's an easily forgettable and indeed largely forgotten attempt at a mascot platformer on a system that has plenty of better ones, to be honest. You play as Casey, also known as Kid Chameleon, because he gains superpowers whenever he wears masks. Just, just like a ch chameleon. The power-ups don't make the gameplay much more exciting though. They'll just give you projectiles or allow you to smash through walls, for instance. It's a pretty basic game. And while we acknowledge that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, holy guacamole, this is one but ugly game. If you do happen to enjoy Kid Chameleon more than other games that are objectively more deserving of your time, you will get to explore more than 100 levels, which we admit is pretty generous, to put it kindly, or far too much, to put it less kindly. Number 45, Landstalker, Japan, Asia, and Western. Landstalker is an isometric action RPG. It has a pretty nice art style, but beyond that, the years have not been especially kind to it. Originally released to positive reviews, it feels more than a little clunky to play today. Landstalker relies at various points on long, demanding platforming challenges, which are hindered severely by the controls and isometric perspective. Failing them may not result in a game over, but it will force you to repeat areas, which gets frustrating very quickly, I'm sure you don't need me to tell you. The combat is also very simple and often unfair, as many enemies have longer reaches than you do, and you aren't nearly nimble enough to evade attacks consistently. The Japanese release of the game remains notable for its very adult situations and jokes, but those were removed and rewritten for Western audiences, meaning Landstalker has been stripped ooh la la, of probably the most significant aspect of its personality. Another point for the censors. Number 44, Outrun 2019, Asia. The distant year of 2019. Who amongst us can imagine the wonders in store? Certainly not the developers of this game, who pretty much decided that the roads might be made of glass and then just stopped there. Outrun 2019 barely even leans into its futuristic setting. The cars don't hover, aliens don't attack, Britain doesn't leave the EU. It's a complete failure of imagination. The gameplay is serviceable, but far from exciting. And while the courses do offer branching paths, they look so similar that there's little point in exploring them. In fact, the only truly amusing thing is that the localizations treat kilometers per hour and miles per hour as interchangeable. This means that your vehicle's already silly top speed of 682 kilometers per hour in the European version becomes 682 miles per hour in the American version. That's almost 1,100 kilometers per hour. So maybe this game does have another idea other than just glass roads for what happens in the future, in that in 2019, nobody will be able to do basic arithmetic. Number 43, Puyo Puyo, Asia. One of the all-time greatest falling block puzzle games, or perhaps falling blob puzzle games, Puyo Puyo started life as something of an afterthought. Technically, the series is a spin-off of Mado Monogatari, a largely forgotten series of RPG dungeon crawlers. Puyo Puyo features characters and other elements from this series, but its gameplay couldn't be more different. Instead of zapping enemies with magic, you are arranging little gelatin-like globs by color 
colour. It's a simple concept, but one which proved to be very fun, to be honest. Line up four or more jelly babies of the same colour, and they wink out of existence. That's it. But the real strategy and satisfaction comes from orchestrating chain reactions to clear more of the little puyos from the board, and send garbage blocks to your opponent's screen. It's a great addictive puzzler that sadly the West isn't getting. At least, not under this name. Ooh, what do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you, with number 42, Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. Western. I'd like to play Puyo Puyo, but unless a terrifying bald man scowls at me from the box art, I just don't believe I will. That's what we assume Sega and Compile must have thought when developing Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. This game is, from tip to tail, just a western localization of Puyo Puyo covered in Sonic the Hedgehog stickers. That doesn't make the game less fun, of course, and it almost certainly sold better as a result of its visual ties to the Sonic universe. It would have been nice, however, to get a proper release of an early Puyo Puyo game on the Mega Drive Mini just so western gamers could get a little taste of the original, but we'll take what we can get. However, we're a little disappointed that the lone western representation of the series is, to be frank, a shameless reskin. But like I say, good enough for us I guess. Number 41, Puyo Puyo Tsu, Japan and Asia. Puyo Puyo 2, which is a pun so we can get away with just calling it Puyo Puyo 2, followed up on the unexpected success of its predecessor by essentially providing more of the same, but better. When Compile developed the first Puyo Puyo game, they didn't treat it as anything more than a simple side project that might bring some quick money. With the second game though, they knew they had a hit on their hands, and so they dedicated more resources and attention to it. This paid off, as Puyo Puyo 2 became the biggest arcade success Japan had ever seen, and the game was ported to as many systems as possible, including the Super Famicom, PlayStation, Sega Saturn, PC, the Mega Drive of course, and even the Virtual Boy, though that version was cancelled alongside the console's mercy killing. We Westerners won't be getting this with our Mega Drive minis, but the untranslated arcade version is included in the Sega 3D Classics collection for the 3DS, so if you really want it, you go get it, Tiger. Number 40, Lord Monarch, Japan. Lord Monarch is an installment in the long-running and largely Japan-exclusive series Dragon Slayer. The closest most Western gamers will have gotten to that series is the NES game Faxanadu, which kind of sounds like an album by Felivia Newton-John. Lord Monarch is a real-time strategy game that features a large number of interesting mechanics, including alliances that, in order for the game to end, must be betrayed by either party, turning much of the experience into a sort of diplomatic game of chicken. You can also liberate condemned men from the gallows, who will then be indebted and loyal to you for life, which is either the smartest or stupidest war strategy we've ever heard. It certainly doesn't look pretty on the Mega Drive, the Super Famicom version easily surpasses it in that regard, but a medieval RTS featuring monsters, rebels, magic and demons sounds like it could be a lot of fun, and we can confirm that it is. Number 39, Space Harrier 2, Japan, Asia, and Western. Space Harrier was a massive arcade hit for Sega, so when it came time for the company to release their Mega Drive, they made sure Space Harrier 2 was included in the launch lineup in both Japan and North America. It arrived shortly after launch in Europe. The original game's success is easy to understand. There was little else like it, and its scaling sprites and world design, inspired by the striking works of artist Roger Dean, made it a game everyone had to try at least once. The sequel was redesigned for consoles, specifically around the specifications of the Mega Drive itself, so that the game wouldn't feel like a downgraded arcade experience and would instead function as a home game that could stand on its own two legs, or, you know, hover, I guess. Space Harrier 2 isn't particularly long, with only 13 stages, but surviving them isn't easy, and true satisfaction only comes with mastery of this frantic experience. Number 38, Monster World 4, Japan, Asia, and Western. Monster World 4 is a divisive game in the series, with some fans loving it and others being disappointed by its low difficulty level and reduced emphasis on exploration. 
Whatever your personal feelings though, it's a welcome addition to the Mega Drive Mini, as prior to this, the game has received only one English language release, in 2012 on the now dead Wii Virtual Console. Leaving Wonder Boy behind, this game sees you taking control of Asha, a young girl with a sword and a chubby little penguin monster that can fly. She sets off to find and help a number of spirits throughout her world, and while the adventure is a rather shallow and easy one, it still manages to be a lot of fun. It's also, it has to be said, absolutely adorable. Monster World 4 has a fantastic art style, and for a low-key platformer, you could do far worse. Number 37, Thunder Force 3, Japan, Asia, and Western. Despite the name, this is not a Michael Johnson simulator. The first Thunder Force game, released in 1983 for the PC, was an impressive overhead shooter that allowed players to steer their craft in any direction. By the time of Thunder Force 3, however, the series reflected the much more common side-scrolling approach. This makes Thunder Force 3 feel a lot like, well, any other game in the genre, really. It does, however, look fantastic, and it still plays pretty well today. In scrolling shooters, the experience comes entirely down to the tactile thrill of blowing things apart, and Thunder Force 3 has that in spades and spades. That's about all it has, but for games like this, that can be enough. It also offers some difficulty options, determining, among other things, whether you lose just your current weapon or all of your collected weapons when you die. That's seemingly a fairly small detail, but it has big ramifications as it helps tailor the game to either beginners or experts. So this is a title you're sure to get something out of, whoever you are. Number 36, Mardo Monogatari I, Japan. That is the letter I, to be clear, not the Roman numeral for one. In fact, Mardo Monogatari I, which I've also heard pronounced Mardo Monogatar I, so I'm really confused, is the last game in the series released for Mega Drive. It is, however, a remake of Mardo Monogatari 1, 2, 3, which consisted of three games but was only ever released as one package, so that technically the first three games are the first game, and this remake of the first three games is the last game? It's easy to understand. As you might guess, this game was Japan exclusive. In it, we guide protagonist Arla Nadia from age five through her teenage years as she explores dungeons and fights monsters. It's a pretty interesting game that we'd probably enjoy, but we'll never know. If only Mado Monogatari I got localized years ago as Dr. Robotnik's Angry Bean Dungeon. Number 35, Ghouls and Ghosts, Japan, Asia, and Western. Ghouls and Ghosts is technically the sequel to Capcom's monster-mashing classic Ghosts and Goblins, but in many ways it's also kind of a superior remake. Arthur, the knight you've seen most often in his underpants, is a bit more nimble in Ghouls and Ghosts, which goes a long way toward making the game less demanding and more fun. Ghosts and Goblins, after all, wasn't just difficult, it required outright precision at many points and relished killing you regularly. By contrast, though, Ghouls and Ghosts, uh, well, never mind, it, it still relishes killing you regularly. Only this time, it more often feels like it's your fault, and that's a big step in the right direction. This is the Dark Souls of the Ghosts and Goblins series. I, I'm joking. The Mega Drive version of the game might not be the definitive way to play it, but it's more than serviceable, still looks great, and is one more opportunity to experience that legendary graveyard song. <laughs> Number 34, Earthworm Jim, Western. As it was ported fairly quickly to the SNES and PC, Earthworm Jim isn't quite a defining Mega Drive title, but its importance to gaming history is clear. It's one of relatively few overtly comic games of its era. It's a self-lacerating, decidedly zany experience that even today manages to stand out well for its absurdism. But is it any good? Well, yeah, kind of. It's certainly a lot of fun, but a number of levels are immediately frustrating and 
never quite recover, such as the one in which you must bounce puppies across the screen, and another that sees you piloting a fragile undersea craft through a series of narrow tunnels. The developers attempted to make as many levels as possible play in distinct ways, which is admirable, but also meant there was less time to test and refine each of those mechanics. And so, ultimately, Earthworm Jim's most impressive triumph is also its greatest liability. Number 33, Yu Yu Hakusho Makio Toitsusen, Japan. Yu Yu Hakusho Makio Toitsusen only left Japan once, for Brazil in 1999, so we aren't surprised that we Westerners are again missing out on this one. But this could have actually been a really fun inclusion. It's a four player fighting game designed by Treasure, who spent this entire console generation proving they could do no wrong. Uh, yes, we are aware of McDonald's Treasure Island Adventure but we stand by our assessment, this is great. It's based on a manga we haven't read, but that's okay, because there isn't a story mode. This game is just a chance for you and up to three friends to kick each other's teeth out, as it should be. There are even two horizontal planes on which players can fight, introducing a literal depth to the combat that is still rare to find in 2D fighting games. It also contains an admirable attempt at digitised speech and lovely sprite work, as well as an absolutely stellar soundtrack. This is one that Asia and the West should be sad they're missing out on. Number 32, Tetris, Japan, Asia and Western. Tetris is a game where you have Look, we don't need to tell you what Tetris is. Whoever you are, wherever you live, whatever your age, close your eyes and you can picture Tetris. It's one of the most famous video games of all time. It's also, however, difficult to get excited about, in a way. Depending on your yardstick, it's arguably a better game than almost anything on this list, but it's also ubiquitous. It's been released for more systems in more versions than we could possibly count, and you probably have multiple copies of it already. That speaks for how good of a game it really is, but also how unexcited we are for its Mega Drive Mini re-release. This particular version of Tetris, though, is noteworthy. Its tangled rights history meant that Sega was not legally allowed to sell or distribute this version of the game, which it had developed in 1989, and so it was never properly released until now. That is legitimately kind of cool, but we can't help but feel that once we get over the novelty, we'll just be playing Tetris yet again. So it's number 32. Number 31, Snow Bros, Japan and Asia. Sharing more than a bit of creative DNA with its far better remembered predecessor, Bubble Bubble, Snow Bros offers very similar screen by screen enemy smashing fun. Pretty much everything you need to know about how the game plays will be clear from about 10 seconds of YouTube footage, so we've got you covered there. But we will add that the Mega Drive version controls well and has an absolutely fantastic soundtrack, which is perhaps the one category in which this game exceeds the standard set by Bubble Bobble, thanks to sheer variety alone. But are Western versions of the Mega Drive Mini poorer for its absence? Well, maybe a bit, but its sheer simplicity means it's not for everyone. That is to say, it may not bowl you over. In fact, it may leave you cold. Submit a third pun in the comments, because frankly I'm ashamed of the scriptwriter for those two. Number 30, Puzzle and Action, Tant R, Japan and Asia. Puzzle and Action Tant R, I think, is another game that never got a proper release outside of Japan, and the creation of the Mega Drive Mini isn't going to change that. And that's a shame, because this one seems like a lot of fun, and the several ports and re-releases Japan has gotten seem to confirm that. You play as detectives hunting down an escaped criminal, which you accomplish by participating in minigames and action sequences. The minigames are selected at random, so each playthrough is distinct distinct, and there's a multiplayer mode to keep things even more chaotic. What's more, the detective theme isn't just a coat of paint, in that the minigames actually rely on brain power more than reflexes. All in all, this amusing curio would have been a welcome addition to the mini's western library, and probably would have earned it some new and appreciative fans. Number 29, Echo the Dolphin, 
Western. Your memories of Echo the Dolphin depend on how far you made it through the game, and whether you've watched a certain one of our list videos. If you only ever played the first few hours, you recall it being a lovely, soothing, beautiful undersea adventure during which you explore the oceans and spend quality time with your aquatic chums. If you finished the game, or watched 10 creepiest moments in kids' games, you remember it being a complete mind screw in which a dolphin goes back in time to smack around a horrifying alien queen. It's one of the strangest games on the Mega Drive, which is why, for all of its flaws, it is a must play. Echo the Dolphin is an important piece of history, even if its design hasn't aged all that well. Labyrinthine levels, unclear objectives, an unexpectedly high level of difficulty, and the aforementioned tonal shifts make the game feel like it can't quite decide what it wants to be. Even so, it is, as we've said, a title like very few others, and well worth including on the Mega Drive Mini. Thank you, Sega. Number 28, Shining Force 2, Asia. Oh boy, there sure are a lot of tactical RPGs we're not getting on the Western Mega Drive Mini. Shining Force 2, the fifth game in the series, is a huge step up from Shining Force 1, which was the second game in the series. Got that? Good. I promise you'll never need to know that information ever again. This time around, the adventure has greater emphasis on exploration, making it feel more than just a linear series of battles. It also allows players to roam more freely between the world's regions, and does a better job of making each of the units feel unique, with their own goals and desires. Shining Force 2 was a more welcoming experience than Shining Force, and every one of its changes is for the better. That said, it's still not something we're all that sorry to miss out on here in the West. Or, or at least me. I don't, I don't speak for all the West. Number 27, Golden Axe, Japan, Asia, and Western. Golden Axe exists to answer one simple question. What if Altered Beast was good. This side-scrolling beat-em-up was an arcade mainstay for years, and its Mega Drive port even added content to the experience, such as a new level, a new ending, and dual mode. So its inclusion on the Mega Drive Mini is a no-brainer, to be honest. Drawing from a number of disparate sources, including Dragon Quest, Double Dragon, and Conan the Barbarian, Golden Axe takes a wealth of great ideas and weaves them together into a fun, challenging adventure. There are three heroes to choose from, each with different abilities and limitations, and it's their job to defeat the Death Adder, sadly not played by Rowan Atkinson. It's a welcome inclusion and one of those firm reminders of why Sega were such darlings of the arcade and console market for many years, even if it seems a long time ago now. Number 26, Beyond Oasis, Japan, Asia, and Western. Known in Japan and on the Japanese Mega Drive Mini as Story of Thor, a successor of the Light, Beyond Oasis is an action RPG with an enduring fanbase. It's similar in many ways to more popular games such as The Legend of Zelda and Secret of Mana, and a number of its proponents feel that it should be held in equally high regard. As Prince Ali, yes, fabulous he, you travel the world defeating monsters and gradually summoning spirits in preparation to conquer a loom evil. It's a fairly standard plot, admittedly, and reviews at the time seemed split over whether that was a good thing or a bad thing. But whatever you feel about the story, the lovely animations, interesting locations, and large amounts of weapons and spells make it an adventure worth enjoying at least once. So come be the first on your block to meet his eye. Number 25, Musha Alest, Japan and Asia. Released in North America simply as Musha, this game failed to stand out to contemporary reviewers who found it too similar to and derivative of the many other vertically scrolling shooters on the market. Time has been rather kind to Musha Alest though, as its reputation has been thoroughly reconsidered. It's now frequently ranked as among the best of its kind. It features remarkable scrolling background effects, addictive 
addictive gameplay and a hard, rocking soundtrack that went through a large number of iterations before its composer was satisfied. It's impossible not to see the love and care that went into creating Musha Aleste. Interestingly, the Japanese and North American versions of the game each had unique stories. Among many other narrative differences, the Japanese version took place in the distant past, and the North American version took place in the distant future. Or maybe it was just a massive translation error. Who knows? Number 24. World of Illusion, starring Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck, Japan, Asia, and Western. Bloody hell, I'm surprised that fit on the screen. After Castle of Illusion turned out to be such a massive hit for Disney and Sega, a sequel was inevitable. Almost as inevitable was the fact that a sequel would not live up to that game. That indeed turned out to be the case, though World of Illusion didn't go down without a fight. This time around, Donald Duck is a main character as well. In one nice tweak, Donald's adventure is just slightly different from Mickey's, as the two must find different ways to progress at various points. World of Illusion is easier than its predecessor, arguably to a fault, and doesn't have the same feeling of charm and imagination that made Castle of Illusion so great, but it's a solid game in its own right, and a fun cartoony platformer worth the couple of hours it might take you to play through it. Number 23, Rent a Hero, Japan. Getting versions of Tetris and Darius we were never able to play before is great, but far higher on our wish list for the Western Mega Drive Mini would have been a localized version of Rent a Hero, which to this day has never made it out of Japan. It's an action RPG with apparently a strong emphasis on humorous dialogue. We'll have to take Japan's word on it because we can't read it, but the concept definitely lends itself to a light-hearted adventure. In Rent a Hero, a young man orders a pizza and is mistakenly delivered futuristic combat armor instead. It costs far more than he was expecting to pay for the pizza, he obviously didn't order Domino's, so he rents himself out as a superhero to the townsfolk, demonstrating superhuman restraint by not calling himself Rent Boy. The game looks like a lot of fun and has a pretty good soundtrack, but for now, it remains out of reach. Number 22, Comics Zone, Japan, Asia, and Western. In Comic Zone, we take control of Sketch Turner, which only seems like a stupid name until you learn that he was originally called Joe Pencil. And that's not a joke either, you can trust us. We would have called him Hank Crayola. Not only does the game resemble a comic, but the format informs the gameplay, as we leap into and out of panels, use borders as handholds, and kick seven shades of India ink out of illustrated baddies. It's a remarkably stylish game that makes the most of its concept, elevating what would have otherwise been a forgettable beat-em-up into one of the most memorable games of its era. Part of the reason it's still held in such high regard is the fact that no subsequent games have even attempted to emulate its approach. Then again, that's probably because Sega patented the style and never used it again. So thanks for that, Sega. No more of this ever, apparently. Number 21, Super Fantasy Zone, Japan, Asia, and Western. While Fantasy Zone's imagery and characters still crop up in Sega's games from time to time, it's largely been forgotten. This might be due to the fact that five games in the series were released over a five-year period, with very little to differentiate them. By flooding players this way, Fantasy Zone might have diluted its own novelty. Super Fantasy Zone is a great opportunity to get reacquainted with the series, or to discover it for the first time. It's a scrolling shooter that has you soaring through colourful environments and killing everything that has a face on it. Clear out the level, defeat the boss, and cash in your winnings for better gear. It's a simple experience, but a profoundly charming one. The only problem with Fantasy Zone is that if you played one game, you've played them all. But it has to be said that that one game, whichever one it is, is still worth playing. So we welcome Super Fantasy Zone to the Mega Drive Mini. Number 20, Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition, Japan and Western. 
Included on the Japanese version of the Mini as Street Fighter 2 Dash Plus Champion Edition, this is one of many, many ports of Capcom's legendary fighting game classic. This version includes the content added to Street Fighter 2 Turbo for the SNES, as well as its own balancing tweaks, alternate character palettes, and playable bosses. However, one of the game's selling points isn't likely to be reflected on this mini release. That is, its support of a special six-button controller. Don't worry, it's still fully playable on the included three-button controller, but the six-button option did a lot to help this game stand apart from its SNES counterparts. Either way though, just about every iteration of Street Fighter 2 is worth a spin now and again. It was a great game then, it's still a great game now, and will probably always be worth spending some time with. Number 19, uh, game no kanzume otaku you? Question mark? Japan and Asia. When the Mega Drive Mini was announced, all you'd hear around the Triple Jump office was, oh, it better have Game No Kanzume Otakuyo on it, or, huh, clearly they wouldn't consider releasing it without Game No Kanzume Otakuyo, or, why don't they just cut out the middleman and release a modern gem remaster of Game No Kanzume Otakuyo? I'm joking, of course, we had absolutely no idea what the blazes this was, or if we're even saying it right. Is that actually the word game, or does it just look like it, translated into English? I don't know if it's Game or Gami. It turns out, though, that this game is genuinely a welcome inclusion. It's a compilation of 12 games, or Gamis, from Sega Meganet, a Japan-only service that has been defunct longer than most of us have even been alive. From a purely historical perspective, this is fantastic fantastic news. Games that would otherwise have been lost to history are instead being kept in circulation. What's more, one of them is Flicky, which introduced a little blue bird who would go on to feature in a huge number of Sonic games to follow. So the inclusion of this game on the Mega Drive Mini means that his debut will be kept alive for decades to come. Number 18, Road Rash 2, Japan, Asia and Western. Motorcycles are fun. Beating up strangers is fun. Combine them and you get Road Rash, a smear or be smeared racing brawler that we're honestly surprised hasn't seen an entry in almost 20 years. The original game, also on the Mega Drive like its sequel, was a simple addictive affair that saw you leaving the flesh of your opponents up and down the roadways of California. Road Rash 2 though took almost everything from that game and expanded upon it, with a greater number of locations for starters, including Hawaii, Arizona and Alaska. Alaska. New weapons, more bikes, and various quality of life improvements were also added, making this by far the superior choice for inclusion on the Mega Drive Mini. The best part though? Road Rash 2's simultaneous two-player mode. The first game had you taking turns, something that doesn't quite work when either racing or brawling, let alone both at the same time. But Road Rash 2 comes with an exciting multiplayer mode that we can't wait to get our hands on again. Number 17, The Hybrid Front, Japan. The Hybrid Front is an interesting futuristic war game that, quite frankly, we would love to be able to play on the Western Mega Drive Mini. It takes place on a version of Earth in a constant state of war for oil and slowly dying from climate change. But don't worry, there are some fictional things that happen as well. For instance, a powerful group of corporate terrorists called Cocoon locks heads with the Pan-Earth Treaty Organization, who really just thinks it would be nice to go a year or two without global thermonuclear conflict. <laughs> hippies. The game unfolds with a series of 26 battles across Earth, the Moon, and Mars, with units capable of fighting on land, in the sea, in the air, and in space. It looks like a game that rewards careful thinking and foresight, and we're disappointed that we won't get to play it ourselves in the UK. Ah. Number 16, Alicia Dragoon, Japan, Asia, and Western. One of the best platformers on the original Mega Drive, Alicia Dragoon is a welcome addition to the Mini. As the daughter of a sorcerer, Alicia's attacks are magic based, and the player must keep a close eye on her magic meter. If it runs out, she'll be temporarily defenseless. This is a bad thing, because Alicia begins the game with only one life. Exercising a high degree of caution, both in dealing damage and avoiding it, is crucial. 
Alicia also has a roster of monster pets that can help her succeed, granting quite a bit more variety to the combat. Lovingly drawn and animated by professionals who worked on films by Hayao Miyazaki of Studio Ghibli fame, Alicia Dragoon takes one of gaming's simplest genres and elevates it to a work of art. Even better, the soundtrack manages to exceed the precedent set by the visuals. This just ticks all the boxes. Great choice, Sega. You go, girl. Number 15, Castle of Illusions, starring Mickey Mouse, Asia and Western. When it comes to licensed games, Disney has been rather fortunate. Whatever system you owned growing up, the odds are good that at least one Disney game was a cherished part of your library, which is more than can be said in general for licensed games, as we know. And if Castle of Illusion was that game for you, well, you just might have had the best of the bunch. This is a gorgeously animated outing for Mickey Mouse that its sequels were never able to top. Critics at the time gushed about its graphics, soundtrack, and playability, and time has done very little to dull our impressions of any of those things. It was surprising to learn that any Disney games at all would be included on the Mega Drive Mini for, you know, licensing reasons and stuff, which makes us retroactively more disappointed with the mini consoles that preceded this one for not including the likes of Chip and Dale Rescue Rangers on the NES. C can we go? Can we do, do it? Can we go again? Just, just include that game, please. Number fourteen: Contra Hardcore, Japan, Asia, and Western. No series is more synonymous with the run-and-gun genre than Contra. From the very beginning, it's been a high-octane, bullet-spraying experience that isn't easy to master, but is even harder to put down. Though it isn't a numbered sequel, Contra Hardcore does pick up after the end of Contra 3, and gives players a number of pretty cool features, including branching paths and characters who have unique abilities and collect different weapons. The controls are tight, and the gameplay is remarkably smooth. The soundtrack absolutely rises to the occasion, and pixel art hyperviolence has rarely looked so pleasing to the eye. It's about as close to perfection as the formula ever got, though 2007's Contra 4 for the Nintendo DS might just take the edge for that honour. Either way, Contra Hardcore is a perfect and welcome inclusion to the Mini. Number 13, Langrissa 2, Japan and Asia. Langrissa is a series that hasn't seen much representation outside of Japan, but it's one that does have a devoted following worldwide thanks to fan translations. Langrissa 2 is a tactical RPG with branching story paths, based on which of the three factions you decide to align yourself with. You can even change sides at various points, meaning you aren't locked into a single path based on one early decision. That's some pretty impressive flexibility for a console game released in 1994. By all accounts, Langrissa 2 was one of the better tactical RPGs on the Mega Drive, and its massive amount of player characters, intriguing story, and numerous outcomes relying on more than just which way the tide turns in battle make it something we wish we were getting with our mini in the West. I keep saying that, it's a bit of a moany list to be honest, isn't it? Number 12, Streets of Rage 2, Japan, Asia, and Western. The Streets of Rage series didn't last long. Between 1991 and 1994, there were three releases. Between 1994 and, well, well, now, there have been zero. Hopefully the worldwide inclusion of Streets of Rage 2 will lead to a whole new generation of fans who can be equally disappointed the series doesn't exist anymore. Yay! Streets of Rage 2, known as Bare Knuckle 2 in Japan, is usually considered the best in the trilogy. It updates and refines the satisfying gameplay of the original brawler, and adds some welcome features. The characters here get their own unique special attacks, the enemies get more varied movesets, and new weapons have been added, all of which results in a much improved experience. The soundtrack is also one of the best on the entire Mega Drive library, and even if you aren't a fan of beat-em-ups, Streets of Rage 2 is worth playing for that alone. Get those beats on. Number 11, Strider, Asia and Western. Strider is just one of many classic series that Capcom doesn't seem interested in giving the time of day to anymore. That loss is ours, because Strider, in both its original arcade form and this Mega Drive port, 
is fantastic. It's a tough-as-nails platformer, with protagonist Hiryu being something of a glass cannon, in that he can dish out excessive punishment, but he dies easily, and tanking hits is rarely an option. The Mega Drive version, to be honest, looks and sounds almost as good as the arcade original, which is saying a lot, and nearly all of the game's content survived the transition. Strider plays just as well here as it did there, and flipping from platform to platform through treacherous stages and waves of enemies never gets old. So, we're not just glad to have it on our Mega Drive minis, we think the system would feel just a bit empty without it. Number 10. Dynamite Heady, Japan and Western one of several truly great games by Treasure included in the Mega Drive Mini, Dynamite Heady is a colourful, inventive, giddy joy. It isn't often mentioned in the same breath as Sonic the Hedgehog or Rocket Knight Adventures, but it probably should be. The visual design of the game is absolutely fantastic. The events are experienced as a kind of insane play, with puppets brawling with each other and a stage light representing your health. The sprites are large and beautiful, and so much happens on screen at almost every moment that it's impressive the Mega Drive was able to handle it in the first place. Though it's been included in a few collections over the years, Dynamite Heady never quite seems to get the attention that it deserves, and we're happy to see it again here. Number 9. Darius, Japan, Asia and Western Whatever your personal feelings about the games on this list, the fact is that each title will have somebody out there with fond memories of playing it on their Mega Drive. Except for Darius, and if anyone tells you otherwise, shout from the rooftops that they're a filthy liar or just didn't realise that they never owned a Mega Drive in the first place. See, this is the first time that the classic arcade shooter Darius is getting a Mega Drive port. Does the inclusion of a brand new release sort of defeat the purpose of a throwback console? Well, yes, but it's also really cool, as it's like peeking into an alternate history. And that aside, Darius is a lot of fun for what it is. While it isn't as well remembered as its contemporaries, such as R-Type or Gradius, it is every bit as challenging, addictive and satisfying. And so we're really excited that it's finally made it to the Mega Drive. Number 8. Dino Brothers 2 – Japan Dino Brothers 2 is a strategy game with dinosaurs. I repeat, Dino Brothers 2 is a strategy game with dinosaurs. The first Dino Brothers was also a strategy game with dinosaurs, but Dino Brothers 2 is a strategy game with more dinosaurs than Dino Brothers 1, making it the superior Dino Brothers strategy game with dinosaurs. Why these games have never gotten Western releases is baffling. We love moving little tanks and knights and soldiers around and watching them do battle. Think how much more we would love moving dinosaurs around to do the same. This is literally what we were doing with our plastic dinosaur toys between ages 2 and 18, for crying out loud. Admit it, even if the game had been terrible, you would have loved this. I know I would have. It's a bloody strategy game with dinosaurs. Like I said earlier, do you, do you remember when I said, yeah. Number 7. Sonic the Hedgehog, Asia and Western Nowadays, a Sonic game is considered a success as long as it doesn't either celebrate bestiality or burn your house down when you play it, but back in the Mega Drive era, he was a force to be reckoned with. Sonic the Hedgehog was Sega's first true system seller. Granted, the game isn't as fast-paced as its marketing would have you believe, and Sonic's physics definitely takes some getting used to, but we all know full well that the fantastic music and bright visuals still hold up to this day. Of the original trilogy, it's often said that this is the weakest Sonic game, though for some it's probably the most nostalgic. Either way, there are a number of irritating sequences, primarily in the Marble Zone and Labyrinth Zone, and Sega was still finding its footing regarding level design, but this absolutely deserves its place on the Mega Drive Mini. Not that there was any chance Sega would have left it off, except for some reason. In Japan. Weird. I don't know why that's happened. Poor Japan, I guess. Number 6. Mega Man The Willy Wars. Japan, Asia and Western. It's wily 
but it looks like Willy. <laughs> the rarity of Mega Man The Wily Wars depends upon where you grew up. In Japan and Europe, we got a nice physical copy to enjoy. In North America, however, it was only available through the Sega Channel, an early dial-up software service that even at that time was immediately identifiable as a bit crap. The Wily Wars is an enhanced collection of the first three Mega Man games for the NES, with new sprite work, remix soundtracks, and a save feature. Purists will almost certainly prefer the original, sure, but there's no question that a great amount of love and care went into this collection, and it's a great experience in its own right. What's more, completing the three games unlocks Willy Tower, Wily Tower, a collection of brand new levels, and you get to choose any of the weapons and utilities from the main three games to take with you. How appetizing. Number 5, Shinobi 3 Return of the Ninja Master, Western. If we Westerners could only get one Shinobi game, we certainly got the right one. Shinobi 3 Return of the Ninja Master is one of the Mega Drive's absolute best games. It has a wonderful soundtrack, precise controls, and remarkably fluid gameplay. It's also quite varied in what it offers. One level, for example, sees you fighting baddies while surfing, a common ninja pastime that's so rarely reflected in video games. Shinobi 3 is about a lot more than cutting bad people to bits with your sword, but rest assured, you will cut plenty of bad people to bits with your sword. This time around, Around, our hero has more moves than ever before, with dash kicks and wall jumps helping every encounter feel unique. Reviewers at the time and today seem to be split evenly between considering the game too difficult and too easy, but they are in near universal agreement that the game is either way fantastic and absolutely worth your time. Number 4, Castlevania Bloodlines, Japan, Asia, and Western. The recent release of the Castlevania Anniversary Collection makes the inclusion of Castlevania Bloodlines, known in Japan as Vampire Killer, slightly less exciting, but it's still one of the best games in the series. The gameplay is similar to that of the first three NES games, feeling quite a bit stiffer and less dynamic than the revelatory Super Castlevania 4, but looking and sounding absolutely fantastic. It also offers up one heck of a challenge, with some of the best level design in the entire series. Players choose between Eric Lacard and John Morris. A number of fans have pointed out that the latter is the son of Quincy Morris, who appears in Bram Stoker's original Dracula, and therefore connects the universe of the games to that of Stoker's book. However, we have it on good authority that Castlevania character Dracula also appears in Bram Stoker's original Dracula, so that shared universe connection probably shouldn't be all that surprising. You make your own mind up. Number 3, Alien Soldier, Asia. I know we really shouldn't complain, as we're getting a decent number of absolute classics developed by Treasure on the Western Mega Drive Mini, but Alien Soldier being exclusive to the Asian version is downright depressing. One of the very best run and gun titles released for the system is also something of a rarity for Western players, as the original release only made it to North America via the Sega Channel. Alien Soldier's emphasis on smooth movement, non-stop action, and the ability to counter rather than simply simply avoid enemy attacks makes it rewarding to play even today, especially for those who like their games to be tough as nails. The adventure unfolds over 25 stages and 31 boss fights. Treasure actually intended to develop 100 bosses for the game, but most of these, and a number of other concepts, were sadly lost to a tight development window. Alien Soldier, however, remains an overlooked masterpiece and a slice of genuine retro bliss. Number 2, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, Japan, Asia, and Western. Which is better, Sonic 2 or Sonic 3 and or Knuckles? The debate continues and always will, but for the purposes of this list, we don't have to worry about the answer because only one of them is on the Mega Drive Mini. Sorry, Knuckleheads. Sonic 2 is, let's not mince words here, a masterpiece. It improves on its celebrated predecessor in absolutely every regard. The level design is better, the bonus stages are better, even that game's stellar soundtrack is eclipsed by this new batch of compositions. Sega struck gold with the first Sonic game, and any follow-up should have been doomed to fail. The fact that Sonic 2 instead left that game in its dust is nothing short of miraculous. The absence of Sonic 3 is disappointing, but there are certainly worse games to be stuck with, as it were, than Sonic 2, such as 
well, every single game on this entire list, apart from number one, Gunstar Heroes, Japan, Asia, and Western. It should come as no surprise that one of the absolute best games on the Mega Drive, and by some measures one of the best games ever made, would also be the best game on the Mega Drive Mini. Gunstar Heroes is Treasure's greatest achievement, and it's one that's always worth coming back to. Not only does the game look fantastic, but its gameplay is near perfect, and its animations, particularly during boss fights, are some of the most impressive on the system. It's a run and gun brawler with remarkable variety, as you can combine weapons for different results. Additionally, the stages are unique and memorable, with highlights including an auto scrolling minecart segment and one stage in which you roll a die and move around a game board. While Gunstar Heroes did not sell well initially, its reputation increased over the years as critics and fans raved about it, and it's finally asserted itself as an all time classic. But perhaps more significant is its also asserted itself as the highest rank on a triple jump list. What an achievement. And there you have it, every game on every iteration of the Mega Drive Mini ranked from worst to best. What did we get terribly inexcusably wrong? Which games would constitute your dream lineup? Are you the one person on earth who genuinely enjoys Altered Beast? Let us know in the comments below. Also, if you have suggestions for any other every X ranked from worst to best videos, let us know. We're always looking for the next opportunity to tell you which opinions are correct. You can follow myself and Triple Jump on Twitter here, and if you want to support the things you enjoy, then why not check out the rewards on our Patreon? Finally, don't forget to like the video, share it with your friends, and subscribe to the channel. I've been Peter from Triple Jump, and thanks for watching.